guys? Hi everyone. Hi. Right. So after this, after that interesting video, let's move on to a boring presentation. I'll try to make it not boring, uh, but it has a lot of code and uh, some things. So we'll try to keep it as lively as possible and try. Well, it's almost lunch time. And I hope everybody would be hungry. So it's like, let's try to make this a little, uh, we can converse and uh, more uh, life. So let's begin. So this uh, <coughs> talk is about uh, modeling RESTful application and why you should not use uh, REST in a uh, URL, uh, verbs in a RESTful URL and uh, your approach should not be like a typical SOAP RPC based where you have verbs. And so to give a background about it, so like uh, uh, I'm from Zevia and uh, I'm a Java developer. So and uh, I'm not a REST purist. So for the first time I was working with REST, my last uh, project, like uh, it was a normal project. So the UI and the service everywhere, everything was in the same JVM. So there was no need, there was no required for any sort of web services. So we just made a plain uh, web application deployed in a Tomcat and everything just was fine. Next time the client came up with the requirement that you need to expose the APIs now and we need to consume it uh, on a mobile device. And now you thought your API should be a RESTful API and uh, what not. So then we uh, got into our application and saw that uh, it was a big task because we have des not designed in such a manner so that it should cater to the RESTful uh, URLs and uh, it might not be exactly pure REST form. So with a lot of refactoring, remodeling, and we had to change uh, what in uh, what way we think. I mean, that's a paradigm shift. So that time <coughs> there was debates like, just get get. Uh, why do we want to be restful? Like, just uh, have URLs in the web and make it look like restful. Expose it over JSRS and consume by Jersey, but just again had verbs in it, and that would also uh, suffice the purpose. But there were things. So in today's talk, we will discuss what were those things. What would go wrong? And the topic is not only about what would go wrong, we'll also discuss caching, one of the huge advantages of using RESTful application. And then we'll go deep inside that. And then finally, we'll see a model. We'll see an application where we'll see the use cases, where we we'll try to fit our uh, uh, RESTful uh, paradigm. So let's begin. So I'm not here to discuss REST versus SOAP or any arguments or any debates. Why should we use SOAP or when should we use REST? It's just <coughs> assuming everybody knows about REST. So REST is there is no specification as such REST, like SOAP is a specification, but REST is an uh, uh, architectural style. So uh, it started with Roy Fielding's paper. Sorry. Yeah. So it started with Roy Fielding's paper in 2000 uh, in University of California, when he has presented a paper about uh, about design of network-based software, so how they should. Uh, uh, behave so that you leverage uh, the best out of a network client server application. So that uh, thought uh, gave rise to the development of RESTful architecture and the uh, new HTTP 1.0 specifications were also got influenced by this architecture. And the biggest implementation of this sort of architecture was web. And that was easy and that was using HTTP. So currently if you say REST and HTTP they go hand in hand but they are not bound. Today we have a, a, a protocol called as HTTP. Tomorrow we might have a new uh, protocol that might leverage the architectural principles of REST. So we might use that. But for now, we could say that while using REST, you are mostly using HTTP. Right. So when you are using a RESTful application, you uh, adhere to HTTP specifications. Because uh, the browsers are implemented using HTTP specification. And if you implement your services as well using HTTP specifications, you would gain certain benefits and you would also uh, be, uh, it will be easy and uh, there are things which we will discuss later. Okay, so typically uh, how you design an application like this is our starting point when we saw that you do a get to retrieve a resource, you put to modify a resource where uh, the ID is already there, you do a post to add an event, you do delete and stuff like that. So this looks like a basic third application but what about other verbs? So our application was like it has approval flow. There was a workflow where we wanted to approve something. There were reject flow. There were cancellation of orders. There was stuff like that. So that time we were faced with the problem of how would we go, like how do we model an application in such a manner that uh, we should avoid these verbs, uh, REST says avoid these verbs. 
So first we wanted to dig into detail why should we avoid these verbs? Why is that uh, so much fuss about this? So can't I just put them in my URL? So let's see one more interesting video. Master Ji, पिताजी की पतलून एक बिलाल छोटी करो ये ले बात करके देख लो बस ले लियो जी जी बिल्कुल सही हाँ जी रमेश सुरेश चला करते क्या मास्टर जी पिताजी की पतलून एक बिलाल छोटी करो अच्छा वो भी सर सही है बीस ले लियो जी बिल्कुल बिल्कुल मास्टर जी पिताजी की पतलू ने एक बिलाल छोटी कर दो बीए कर रही तीस ले लो देखो जैसा आप अबे मास्टर जी पिताजी की पतलू ने एक बिलाल कैडबरी फाइव स्टार की हर बाइट में है चौक सो तो so let's say our problem is, so we need to design this API where you have to make sure that uh, your API is such that you want to decrease the length of Pitaji Ki Patloon <laughs> and uh, you handle it in such a manner and then you mess up the API and you do something like what Suresh Ramesh did, they made a mess of it and uh, there were no safeguard, there were no tol uh, fault tolerance and so that what happened? It was a disaster. So, uh, why I wanted to put this slide and why I wanted to show you this video to uh, show you the concept uh, of uh, HTTP specifications called as safe and unsafe methods, add and potency, all those things I wanted to discuss. So <clears throat> let's go deep inside the HTTP specifications and what HTTP has to say about safe and unsafe methods. Right. So this is an excerpt from HTTP specification. It says that get and head should not have any side effects. That means Whenever you are doing a get, you should always need to retrieve a, uh, some resource and it should never change the request. So if we would use a get here, so we cannot use a get in that Taji Patloon because we are changing the state. Right. So next concept is idempotency. And uh, this uh, concept basically means, so if you operate an operation n number of times, the result would always be the same. So if you say a is equal to 4 is an idempotent uh, call, you do it 100 times, the value of A would be 4. But A++ plus plus is a non-identifiable method. And if you do that A++ plus plus 400 times, the value of A would always be 4, would always change whenever you do that. So this idempotency, why is this important? So whenever you are using idempotent methods, which uh, would not change, uh, which would not, uh, which would have a same effect how many number of times you execute it, so HTTP would take care of that. HTTP would understand that these are idempotent methods and whenever you are using an non idempotent method. So HTTP could make sure that it has some fault tolerance, some uh, safeguard against that. So post is a non post is the only non, non idempotent method here. So difference between put and post whenever somebody asks you. So this is the main difference between put and post. Put is not put is idempotent and post is not. Okay. So what do we gain out of this idempotency? Suppose uh, in your application, uh, sometimes what will happen uh, in uh, your browser is if you open the small network. Uh, your uh, calls in your browser, you will see that you have made one request, but actually two, three requests might have gone. That browser does some optimization, and browser, if there is a timeout, it sends a request automatically. So if it's a non idempotent method, browser will not hesitate to send the request again. And if the request timeout, and if you say uh, you bypass the browser, you make sure that browser is not sending anything, but suppose network times out and your transaction is break in between. So how do you make sure that uh, your uh, which part of your API has uh, which part has uh, faulted, and how would you make sure that uh, where you had gone wrong? Then you might have to uh, actually uh, store the state. But again, HTTP is a stateless protocol. Then you have to go back to your SOAP RPC method, and you will <coughs> again lose all the benefits of REST and uh, make it in such a manner. So, yeah. So one more safeguard which browser provides you is like a confirm a form submission. So whenever you are doing a post, like you are submitting a form, so by default, uh, if you press the F5, if you refresh it, so you see on browser that browser asks you, 
Are you sure you want to refresh it because this URL you have already submitted. So browser recognizes this. So this is a fault tolerance provided for free. Suppose you did not have, uh, you did not want to leverage this. What you have to do? You have to make your API. Suppose uh, there's a script in a, for update of database. You write first line if DB does not exist. If DB exists, do not perform this. So that is a uh, way you have yourself catering to item potency. But in this, you don't have to worry about it. Right. So next, most important thing uh, which uh, I like about REST is caching. So this <coughs> non-safe and non-identified methods will never be cached by any of the proxies or the caching uh, mechanisms available. So, <coughs> what? Are, but all the safe methods will always be cached, depending on certain criteria, some certain header parameters, which we are going to discuss detail into caching. But get and header candidate for caching. So now, what would go wrong if you use a get? for a put uh, to update a method. Suppose you call a get and you do update. First time it would uh, run fine. So when a request goes to a server and it's a get request, so when the response comes back from server, the browser caches that request for you, that response for you. And next time you render the same URL, the browser gives you the cache. So this time you would give a stale data, <coughs> get a stale data. Because the request won't go to the server, it won't up update it and you'll get a stale data. So this was one of the things that might go wrong with the improper usage of the verbs. Okay. Another thing is like, uh, if you have a URL like this, so suppose this data is dependent something on the client and this data is actually not, respons is not responsible for changing the resource. So what happens is, but since the URL has changed, so browser sees that this is a different URL. So every time it sees a different URL, it will make a request to the server. It will not provide you a cache result. But what our case, we, we did not need it to change the resource. We did not, we could have done with the caching. So that is a huge overhead on the network. So that is like you are congesting the uh, network and you are not optimizing and you are not leveraging the caching capabilities. Right. So. Any questions or if you are not boring anybody? It looks little bit everybody is. Okay. So let's move on to HTTP caching. <coughs> so we have talked a lot about HTTP uh, caching and uh, we have seen that one of the major benefits of using RESTful REST is HTTP caching. So let's see how many types of caching is there and how does caching perform and how can you write code to actually control and configure the caching. So let's see what is browser cache. So browser cache is simple. You have your local laptop, your mobile, your uh, PC, and you whenever you do a get, it goes to the server. It takes the response. So that response is cached by the local cache. Now what happens is when you do a request on the same URL, so that is fetched from your local cache. Unless and until you specify, you maybe set an expires header or something like that. We'll discuss that in later. But this is the main concept of a uh, local browser cache. Second sort of uh, crash is a proxy cache. And uh, this is like, <coughs> say, for a geographical area, for a small area, you have uh, set up the proxy servers. So instead of your local browser, you are actually leveraging a proxy cache server. So your request first will go to a proxy cache server and see if the result is cached over there and then only it will render it. If it's cached, it will render it, and if it's not cached, it will make a no call to the server. So benefit of this is, suppose we all are sitting in a room, and you, you also try to hit a URL, I also try to hit a URL. So now, because we are, we, there is a proxy server uh, which is situated on this uh, particular space, so I won't congest the network. I would actually get a cached copy of the response which you had already requested from the server. So squid can be used for this proxy server. Any, basically any HTTP server can be used for that. But Squid has this use case for that to provide something. Okay, the third uh, type of uh, caches is like the reverse proxy. <coughs> so this is like a virtual server, which is placed in front of your actual server. So different between the normal proxy server and the reverse proxy server is, in that your requests were first going to a uh, local proxy server, and then it was fetching and seeing that if the response is cached, I'll serve you with that. If it's not cached, I'll make a hit to the server. Here, you don't know that there's a cache. There's a server behind that. You are actually implementing it on the server side. So you have this server. 
you are shielding your server with a virtual server in front of it. The benefit of this is whenever from entire globe a request comes to you, so you actually see it's cached. If it's cached, you will serve from here and you will not actually disturb your application server. You don't want to uh, congest the network, you don't want to load the server when you can actually serve from a, a virtual proxy server just uh, implemented in front of it. So there is one more type of uh, uh, caching which is which is out of scope of here, but just wanted to mention is that the normal application caching like Infinispan, data grids, or EH cache, those are application caches. Those are like for database we are doing. When we are calling a, uh, making a call to database, we are keeping the objects in memory or on some data grid. So that is application level caching. So that caching is expensive. We are talking about the uh, client side stuff. Uh, I didn't get the difference between proxy cache and uh, reverse proxy. Okay. So proxy cache basically is for a small geographical area. You s you have set up servers, so you know where it's going to hit. But uh, gateway cache is like <clears throat> you hit the internet, you hit the google.com, and then uh, there would be like 10 web servers placed. So every web server would have a shield of a proxy server in front of it. So for if the request is coming for that particular server, I am headed to a server which is in Los Angeles. So that Los Angeles server would have a shield of a proxy server, virtual server in front of it. So my request will not go, my request will look like it's going to the LA server, but actually it might go to a data center to another server. So that is on the, that is you have configured a reverse proxy in front of your server. But proxy caches that was laid on the geographical areas, mostly to serve for an area, like CDNs leverage that proxy caches. This is a concept of content delivery networks. So you have a static content, you have pictures, you have JavaScript files, all those are served from a CDN. So that can be one use case for proxy servers. So as I have told, uh, server-side caching is expensive, it reduces latency, it reduces network traffic, and CDNs can leverage proxy caches. So this uh, caching is useful. <coughs> So right, so, but to use caching effectively, you have to make sure that your invalidation, your stale caches, your expiration, and your volatile data, so all those things you have to be very careful about that and you need a mechanism to control the behavior of these proxy caches of these servers and also control the expiry time of these uh, caches. How do we do that? Okay, so do that, HTTP provides us with headers. So. Uh, before HTTP 1.1, so they had only one header called as expires. <coughs> so that use that was used to basically pass a timestamp. Later they got cache control, e tag, last modified, and different validation headers. We are going to discuss in detail all these headers. Okay. So first one is expires header. So <coughs> whenever you would make a uh, call to the server, so server sees the request. Server when it's sending back the response, it will send a timestamp inside the HTTP response header expires. So this timestamp <coughs> would be cached by a uh, local cache. So whenever next time you are making that same request, so it will check to see that if uh, the timestamp has expired or not. If it has expired, so it will uh, <coughs> make a call to the server. And if it has not expired, so it will serve you uh, with a cached copy. So, but uh, this was very rudimentary, and if, uh, this works mostly for uh, uh, like your browser caches, but now we have proxy caches, reverse gateways, and all those stuff, and we would write more extensive controls. Okay, so before like uh, I go on to the next type of uh, header, let's see how JAXRS provides support for expires. So JAXRS uh, specification for RESTful services gives you an argument in your response builder. The response builder is basically used to build the response, and you have to send back uh, the response. So that you can actually set builder.expires, calculate, uh, this is the this is the timestamp when I am then this push is 25th of, 25th of August. I have put this expiry date and then I am sending it. So when I am sending this, in the, the response header, it has already set the expire stack. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, so we needed richer set of features, more explicit controls. So 1.1 came up with more advanced features in header. So this, the foremost and most important is uh, the cache control header. Okay. So cache control header <coughs> uh, has some uh, 
attributes, these are comma separated attributes, which can be used to define the behavior of a uh, caches. So see, pub, private and public. So if you say private, only a browser can cache it, but and the, the proxy caches, the CDNs, all those cannot cache it. And if you say public, everybody can cache it basically. No cache. So basically, every get, every get request is cached. So, but if you say no cache, so it won't serve you with the cache. But if you say no store, so that means it's some uh, secure data and you don't even want to cache it, don't even want to store it. That's the difference between no cache and no store. Max age is like again the timestamp, but that is not, uh, max age is in, given in the seconds, not timestamp. So it will basically tell after how much time this is expired. So let's see code for this. Again, JAXIS provides us with the cache control class. <coughs> so uh, you can actually go ahead and initialize an object of cache control, give the attributes of cache control, set max age, set no store, set private, and when you are sending the response by response meter, you can actually set this cache control, and this will automatically populate your response headers, and this will tell the proxy to cache and the exhibit the behavior which is intended here. Okay. <clears throat> so next level of optimization is required here. So what happens is you have set the expiry date, you have said this should be public, this should be private, and you have that's fine. You so told that after 25th of August this data would become stale. But you don't actually know that this data would actually become stale or not because you are sitting at server. You don't know that this, this data might change in future, this data might not change in future. So why can't we optimize it? Like, let's see that although I said that my data would be expired on a certain date, but that might not actually expire. So why don't I make a revalidation request to the client, to the server saying that this was the data that was cached, that was to be cached till this day, but actually has it expired. So that's called as conditional gets that we use. So that's where revalidation comes into picture. So to do that revalidation, uh, this cache control uh, is not enough. So we have two more tags called as last modified and e-tag, right? So let's see how this works. So first, let's see last modified. So what happens is when you send a request, a get request to the server, uh, this the server sends. Uh, uh, sets the response header with maximum age and also sets the last modified for this. So this was the last modified when the, the data had uh, been modified and on historically you would say that this data changes for every thousand seconds because if this is our use case and it changes every thousand seconds so historically you would say it changes thousand seconds and this was the last modified and you send it to the uh, server to the uh, sorry uh, the client. The client caches it. So next time when thousand seconds have passed so it would see, uh, it would again do a conditional get. So next time the request comes to the uh, uh, request comes, so it will see, okay, this has expired. Let me see if that if that's valid or not. So then it will make a conditional get. So what conditional get does is, it will append a tag in the request header if modified says <coughs> the value of last modified. So it will ask the server that has it been modified. Now the server will see <coughs> that is it modified or not. If it's modified, then you need to invalidate the cache, you need a fresh data. So the typical 200 responses set with a fresh data. But if the request, if the data has not become stale, it, we do not want to invalidate the cache. So our request or response code of 304 is sent. So when you receive a 304 response, that means you can actually uh, go ahead with the cache. So this mechanism is used very much these days in the uh, current applications to uh, optimize the performance. Okay. So second one is like e tag. So instead of using that uh, last modified timestamp, we use a e tag. So e tag is basically an MD5 hash which for which is generated out of the resource. Okay. So benefit of this uh, <coughs> again this works in the same manner. It sends the hash code to the uh, server, server again generates the hash code out of the resource and compares those two. If that has expired, if that is that has changed, the hash code does not match. And if the hash code does not match, it sends a request uh, of 200 with a new response. And if it uh, matches, that means 304, do not change it. So how? What is the benefit of using e tag against last modified? 
So e tag is basically a hash. <coughs> so suppose you have a user object. Now, so user object might have some audit field or some fields which actually do not make sense to the UI. We do not, even if those field changes, you can, you do not want the cache to invalidate. So in that scenario, you can actually go ahead and generate the tag out of only those, generate the tag, the hash code, out of only those values. So that means that is a weak hash code or a strong hash code. You can actually control the behavior to what extent your cache should be invalidated. That is the major benefit of using e-tag. So, yeah. So let's say I have a JavaScript file, for example, jQuery, yeah. which I know won't change. Yeah. So uh, how do I like set, set its e-tag? Like, is there something on the server, Nginx, Apache, I can do so that it, it gets the e-tag, mm -hmm. and uh, the next time the page doesn't have to pull the whole jQuery file again? Because you can populate the uh, response header with that. So now, is there any way to automate that? Like, how, how can we do that? For APIs, I, uh, JaxRS provides uh, all the support. Oh, okay, okay, okay. But for this, I have not seen it. One way which I have used instead of using hashtags or uh, HTTP headers for JavaScript is like I appended the yeah, yeah. timestamp and whenever it's possible, so change the URL so it's possible. Yeah, right. Facebook does that, but e-tag is like more recommended. Yeah. And uh, who is computing that? MD hash? The server. The server, the server the generates this, sends this to the client so in the response header. Server means. Like, I have to write a code, yes. that's the server end, right? Yes. So I'll show you how. That's pretty easy. That's, uh, Jack Saras provides you out of the box. So, I was thinking maybe one could write a Nginx or Apache module. Yes. That could do that because uh, I don't want to have the pain of doing this for everything that I serve, right? I mean, if that is possible. Yeah, you could do that. Okay. So, uh, <coughs> JaxRS provides us with a class called as request. So, this request is an injectable helper class. So, it has certain methods called as post conditions, preconditions, which would actually go ahead and extract out the header, the request header, see what is the e tag, and then you have to uh, generate an e tag out of the resource, and then they can actually check the tags, and if uh, the condition is met, so it will populate the response back to the uh, client. So all that can be done. Let's see the code. Okay. Okay, so this is <coughs> a sample code which I have written. And uh, what happens is when the, whenever the first time the request comes. So the request has come to get the user with certain ID. So I am getting the user. Then I will generate the, this entity tag is again a class which is provided by uh, JaxRS. So then, <coughs> using the hash code of that user, I'll generate the entity tag. So this entity tag is generated, and then I need to set, build the response and send it back to the client. So if I use this request.evaluate preconditions tag, what it will does is, it will basically check in the header which has come from the client that any hashtag exists or not. So that means a hashtag does not exist. It's the first time request. So basically, it will return a null. Right. So basically, it will return a null. And when a null is returned, so that means there is no uh, tag was present. And it will uh, build the response, populate with the new user object. And then it will send the cache control, which was max age, and this e tag. This would be sent to the client so that client can cache it and store it with itself. And see, after the max age has expired, it can resend that e tag. To do the to the revalidations. So next time when the request comes, what happens is, so this e tag is again generated. So now when the condition goes to evaluate preconditions, so this method itself <coughs> from the request finds what is the uh, response, what is the request header. From the header it finds out whether there is an e tag. Okay, it finds there is an e tag. So it tries to match it. So if there is a match and the cache is valid. So it, it, it returns some value of the builder. That means builder is not equal to null. So just return uh, a response. So this automatically makes the response of 304. This has injected into the header. So this you just send it back. Say 304. This is an optional. You want to reset the cache control time. Say because you said 1000 minutes is has expired. Let's add 1000 more time. Something like that. And if it gets uh, invalidated, so it will again send that. So this is very straightforward. You can actually uh, use it inside whenever you are designing your APIs, your RESTful APIs. 
Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so this is one interesting method which I have found. This is an unofficial method. So some browsers might not support it. I might not, I am not recommending this, but uh, this is an interesting thing to look at. So this is a purge method. So what happens is, uh, let me show you by example. So you do a get, first time it goes to the server, you do a get again, you get from the cache copy. And then you do a put. That means you are sending an unsafe method. You want to actually modify the <coughs> uh, say uh, modify the resource over the server, and you want that the local copy should be uncached. This is assuming that your APIs are bad. You have not at all have uh, any, set up any cache control to do, and you don't trust that your APIs would actually work. Your cache control would actually work or not. This is like, like a hack. Then you send a purge. This is client is sending the purge for that. Uh, particular AP, uh, URL. So this will actually delete all the cache for that particular URL and then whenever you do a get, so you will uh, get a fresh copy. Make sense? But better ways to do using cache control headers and ETAG. Right. Okay. So enough of the code. So we will see code more again. So let's try to complete our Pitaji ki Patlun problems now that we have understood what will go wrong, what are the benefits, how cache exactly works, and <coughs> what to solve this problem. It's pretty straightforward. You cannot use get because get has side effects. So I require something like that, get Pitaji Patun 12 length method decrease size. So this caching will not allow this, and this won't work. So you would have put, so this is exactly the case where disaster would happen. So you do a put to decrease the length, now, if browser sends this request three times, so you know what the result would be. Right, delete, so that don't make sense. You are uh, you are confusing the client who's using the API. What exactly is, are you deleting, or you are updating, or you are decreasing? Post. So post is the only unsafe method, the non-idempotent, not the only unsafe method, not only non-idempotent method, which should be used in this case. So this would be the solution for that. You are sending <coughs> the URL and you are sending a JSON data with that, the form data, and you are sending a post. So now suppose Ramesh and Suresh forget that they have uh, asked the tailor to reduce the length or not. So whenever uh, he'll, uh, they again try to refresh it, they say tailor again, the tailor would actually stop them and ask, hey, are you sure you want to refresh it? Are you sure you want to uh, uh, send this request again because you have already done that. So that is fault tolerant API support you got from the browser for free of cost. But then uh, that means you are saying for updating data you are using post. Yeah. But REST recommends uh, using, like I am just saying that REST recommends using post for creation and put for updating. No, uh, REST uh, does not say a direct mapping. So generally it's like that when you know a resource that their resource exists and you want to uh, perform certain operation on that, that's mostly an update. So you use put. Yeah. And when you want to use a uh, create a new resource, so you use a post. post. So reason for that is idempotency. Suppose you use a put to create a new resource, you can do that. Yeah. But if it again, so two resources might be created, but you did not intend to make it. Right. So put and post only difference is idempotency. When you see you want to make it idempotent, you use put, and you you know that this operation cannot be idempotent, you use post. It's not respective of you want to create or you want to update. Yeah. Okay. So, Anirudh? Yeah. Could you always, um, I mean, if you have like this cutting of the classes, um, you can always make that item on the cloud side before you send it. You can write your API in such a manner or you can, uh, some sort of mechanism you need to write to make the item put in. You need to see that, like typical cases, database scripts. You see if the database, whenever you are trying to create a new database, a new table, you see if table exists. That extra line of code you need to write. So this is automatically you are getting the benefits of that. Uh, 
HTML. I mean, you can directly call the URLs, right? So HTML. I, I have created a simple HTML form. Yeah. In, in my uh, form, I action tag, I mention my URL. Yeah. Right? Uh, and action tag, you can mention get and post, put, delete, whatever, and then the URL. So, yeah. can we, uh, uh, does HTML post support put and delete? Why won't it support? Somewhere I have read that. Yeah, it's actually true. Uh, some browsers you have to write a Java, some JavaScript to actually. So, if, for example, in Rails, uh, directly HTML does not support that, put or delete, okay. but it changes the method through JavaScript. So, I don't know what the current situation of the browser mm -hmm. is, but yeah, six months back or one year back, uh, that was the case. Okay. So maybe I'm not aware of it. But through it's jQuery or any API, you can still make that put or post, uh, put or delete. Put or delete. Yeah, one of the thing is browser refresh, another thing is uh, latency issues. Browser does some optimizations which it does under the hood which we do not know. Sometimes there is a resource which it tries to get and if it uh, say the timeout has happened, it sends a request again without even you knowing that. But there might be some uh, issue with the network, it might be congested, so it, it does a make a request again. You really want the request to be made again, because you've not reached the resource, so you really want the resource. Yeah, that's how it works. I, I can give you a use case for that even. Like there's an approach for, uh, to handle some sort of transactions, I won't say transaction, some sort of atomicity with the use of uh, RESTful APIs. So how they do is, like there's a, uh, uh, there's a pattern called as TCC, try, commit and cancel. So what they do is they maintain an intermediate state where they suppose you want to book and book, uh, order a book. So first step is you send a request to order a book. If the transaction is successful, you try it again to confirm the order. If it's if it fails, you try to uh, send a delete and confirm, uh, delete that initial that uh, intermediate state. So for that, it does not get a re uh, response. When it gets a response, it, it's not sure that it has actually deleted or actually uh, you. Uh, actually the thing has performed or not. So that's why it does put again and it does a, a get again. So that keeps on happening until because uh, why it keeps on happening is you have gone to some payment gateway, right? So payment gateway might take 10 minutes to actually process your order or it might take 2 minutes to process your order. Meanwhile, you do not know your API which is an in intermediate state which the object which is stated in intermediate state does not know that your transaction was completed or not. So that's why it will keep on making a request and uh, you can always define a timeout set till 10 minutes. This happens in a and all the booking scenario like when you are doing ticket booking. Suppose you uh, go for a book my show and you book a ticket. What will happen is if the transaction fails for 3 minutes or 4 minutes the uh, seat if you again go back it's blocked. That's what that time it's again uh, been sending a put 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 again it's sending a put and it's doing a get but under the hood to see that the request got completed or not. That should that those things happen. So those things even the browser does that. So browser makes sure browser assumes that your put is item potent. So that's that's what a use case where it works. Any other question? This caching works in the clustered environment, like it's some server fails, the cache is also copied to the so that is that I would implement using the server side caching, right? Yeah. So that is like uh, my different data grids and my different application server, like typical cases like you use a memcache or ehcache. That is different space altogether. So this is different space. So you will revalidate the session, you will replicate the session on different memcache server. It is uh, like I need to do some coding to like move this that cache or server supports this caching to be moved to the backup server. Which server are you talking about? Uh, I have application server and uh, I'm sending a request and you, you said the proxy servers uh, are there. So my proxy server will check uh, if the response is changed or not mm -hmm. and then send the request. Like this server fails or there is a backup server in, in, is there also. So will Okay. So you could do that. So that, that will basically server-side caching. On that proxy server, you would configure a cluster. 
So you want to have instead of one proxy server, you want to have a cluster of proxy servers. Yeah. So inside that you can have the caching like eh cache or mem cache that can actually do your session replication and all those stuff can can be done that for you. But that is again the once the URL the request has come to you, then you are playing with that on that level. Okay. So let's uh, we're running off of let's see our use case which I discussed in uh, the beginning about adding a friend, removing a friend, friend request. So the traditional approach where uh, this was our approach which we did like anybody would do this way, like you have a user friend mapping table. So the use case is clear. So you want to, <coughs> uh, you want to make a social website where you want to send, uh, be able to send a friend request to a person. So that person would approve the friend or reject a friend and uh, delete a friend or you want to search all the users and find that this user I want to send a friend request to, all those scenarios are there. So, but this is not a plain crud. So many verbs are there. If you go for RPC style, you would end up making a huge uh, uh, SOAP based API, which would be uh, again going into SOAP versus this. It will be uh, non-extensible and tightly coupled and all that. Okay. So, how would we uh, map it? So we make a user friend mapping table. So typically you have this, this is Hibernate. Yeah. So uh, you have a user ID, you have a friend ID, and you have the status. So when you send a request, so you will send, the, suppose I am sending a request to uh, you, your ID is five, my ID is one. So I'm sending, one is sending to five, and then the status would be sending pending. That request would be sent, and that would be my friend request. When you want, uh, so how would I send a friend request? This is sending a friend request. I'm doing a post on the user friend mapping. I'm sending user ID, friend ID, and status as pending. Now when I want to approve this friend request, I would, I'm having the same URL. I'm doing a post on same, but my status has changed to approve. Okay. When I want to reject a friend, I'm doing a delete on user friend mapping table. And when I want to delete an exist friend, I'm doing a delete on the same. This is not very intuitive, and there's a problem in this. I'll explain you what the problem. I want to get, get the pending friends. You would do users on status pending. Okay. So can anybody tell me what is the problem in this? URLs are fine. It's restful. Everything is working fine. Anybody? The force would be cached. <coughs> force one uh, get pending friends would be cached. So it would give. No, but the URL would change, right? No, the, the get uh, URL that you are sending that is the static. That's not the URL not is not changing. Yeah. That would give the cache. The so that you can handle by response headers. For <coughs> rejecting, you are using delete, which is actually uh, like not deleting a resource, but you should ideally use post or put. Because you are just updating your call, uh, call of the record. So, but I want to delete the entry. That is my intent. Oh, okay, okay. I want to delete the resource. Exactly. That would also be a problem. Because you want to actually have all the details of who have requested me. Yeah. But I have actually not deleted them. But actually I want to save the friend request as well. Yeah, so, here the problem is separation of concern. You have two states in between. First is request phase, second is the relationship phase. And you had only one table, the mapping table. That was that was catering to both the uh, phases, both the uh, interactions. So this problem would come whenever you want to extend these APIs. So your queries will become complex. Your URLs, you would have to spend more time. That's, this was exactly what happened with us. We need to do a lot of, uh, we need to write a lot of code to cater to that. Yeah, again, single domain getting responsibility of two states. Separate domains would give more flexibility. Let me show you one example where we face this problem. Right. Uh, in that scenario, suppose I want to find all my friends. What will happen? Suppose Rocky sent me a friend request. Rocky's ID is 1. My ID is 5. So in the user mapping table, 1, 5, and after the status confirmed. Now, I send a friend request to Rahul. My ID is 5, Rahul's is 6. So 
एंट्री बुट की यूजर आई डी फाइव राहुल सिक्स अल्फा कंफर्म कंफर्मिंग स्टेटस फाइव नाउ वेन आई वॉन्ट टू फाइंड ऑल माई फ्रेंड्स आई नीड टू आई द मेन अ यूनियन इन साइड माई अ बैड क्वेरी यूनियन एज वी ऑल नो इज एक्सपेंसिव और यू नीड अ टू कॉल्स फर्स्ट वी नीड टू फाइंड get all friends who i requested then i have to find get all friends who added me this is a bad code this is one of the problems which clearly was visible with that and this is a simple uh, object oriented problem like you are not separating the concerns no rocket science in this i'm just highlighting it okay <clears throat> so with this uh, i try to introduce i mean everybody knows about this resource oriented architecture so for me resource oriented architecture is nothing but uh, it's more of a more of an object oriented approach where you are actually uh, separating the concerns only the paradigm which you have to change is you have to understand that the states the interactions are also uh, a resource they are also domains you can actually make them domains and then you are separating their concerns so the request is a domain concern the request is just to handle what is coming what is going who has sent the request that's it he does not want to maintain the relationship second domain would be a relationship so that is maintaining who is my friend and uh, what is my relationship with that friend later you might add follow a friend as well the, all those relationships can be maintained relationship table and the request i think that's very clear everybody understands that right yeah so that is research resource oriented architecture so if you make this resource oriented architecture and you don't uh, your model is are perfect so your urls would automatically won't have verbs so that's the, uh, let me show you this way so your alternate approach you have a friend request a model and you have a say, user friend or friendship or relationship as a model so now <coughs> you are doing a post you are doing a post on friend requests to basically send a friend request you are creating a new resource called as friend request for a particular friend and a particular user that's a post whenever you want to approve and reject a friend request you are uh, <coughs> whenever you approve it a friend request you are creating a new entry in the mapping not the mapping table the relationship table which i am calling it as user friends table so inside the user friends table i am <coughs> sending this uh, friend request with the i22 so this data would cater to user friends and this will add new entry in that and maintain a relationship with that friend if you delete a friend request you will just delete a friend request with that you can actually change this as well you can have a uh, another column in friend request where you could say uh, uh, binary uh, sorry uh, the boolean say object boolean uh, values a related or not and you can actually do a put and delete and re can reject a friend request can be a put with rejection and if you want to remove a friend completely you would do a delete on user friends so this has changed so you are doing a delete on friend request here you are doing on user friends similarly if you want to do a get all the pending requests you would do on the request if you want to find the friends you would do a uh, on the friends so this was more cleaner approach and any questions on this so this was the modeling uh, this thing also i wanted to introduce like a uh, 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 best practice of using search search so get is made in such a manner that it says there there is something called as query params so it says select star from name where first name is abc and age is 25 so this is exactly a query you do a get on users with a query params first name abc and age 25 you can later add pagination as well in this suppose you have 1000 results you want to paginate uh, the results you can actually add in the url the pages so another uh, i would say myth is that you don't want to use query params in your restful url so restful url does not say anything about not using query params it just says that you have to follow the http specification you make sure that uh, the resource is represented in such a manner that you have get and post on that and you are leveraging the idem potency and safe concept Basically, what is the best practice? Because in the earlier examples uh, that you have shown the get request, so the ID is being shown as a path there. Yeah. And, and even if you just Google it, you will just see a lot of examples where 
all these, uh, if you will, uh, you are talking about get or update, you will always see these IDs as a as a part of a path parameter. Yes, yeah, because that is representing a resource. That is basically a representation. This is not a representation. That's why I'm passing that into query parameter. Complete resource will make a representation. So you you give the path params when you uh, have that representation. Suppose users slash id1. That means that is a resource inside a database. That is a table inside a database. So query params are for that querying. You are sending a subset of that resource. You are changing the result based on this. So suppose I did user slash just moments. I did user slash one. That means there is no uh, uh, change in that. I'm just returning all the uh, the user with ID one. But this is sending me a subset of my results. A users this this would give me a list of all the users. This is a subset of that list based on this queries, right? Source you have. Yeah, I was just asking um, myself, wouldn't this uh, if, uh, influence the caching? This would work, work fine with caching. Like this is a particular, uh, like this is a unique result. But usually caches don't like query parameters. No, no, cache. See, if you go to that URL. This URL had some parameters which did not help in representing a resource, which was just appended for some purposes, like sending some client ID or something like that, which might not have been representing a resource. This complete, if this is a complete resource and these are query params for a particular, a unique set of data, then this would work fine because that data is again to this because next request you would again send the same thing. But if your request is adding all these uh, query params just for the sake of doing something, but th those two are not different resources. So this will not cache. Why, why will this not cache, but the other one No, no, this will also cache, but you will not return the cache result. So ideally, you should not be using additional parameters, which are like, not which are not responsible for uniquely identifying that resource. So, so the, some of the parameters might not be responsible for uniquely identifying the resource. So what will happen is, next time you want to uh, buy five apples. So yes, yeah. So you want to send a request to uh, get five apples with orange with a red color and from California. So red color California five. These three attributes are your defining attributes, right? So if you combine these attributes, you will get a unique result. If your URL has only these three, next time whenever you will ask for five apples, red color from California, if your URL does not have any other information, you will be able to return, retrieve from the cache. Suppose in your same request, every time you are appending some ID or some stupid parameters which were not uh, used for identifying Requester name. Request. Requester name. Request or name. Say method is equal to this, 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 some sort of stuff like that. So those, your two requests could actually be same, but they are not representing. You are not uh, retrieving uh, because they are different URLs. Maybe we can discuss it offline. I'll explain you. Sure. So I have just one other question. This is not related to this one. So I'm also a bit confused about uh, what should be our response code for the put and delete. So one response response button allows you to one like uh, show the response code I accepted and one has no content. So I'm just on the bit understanding on when to use it. Sorry. So for example, I have a user's entity, right? And I want to delete a user with the ID say one two three blah blah blah. And when this operation is successful inside my delete operation, my response builder should uh, pass which. Uh, status code. Is it like accepted or it, it should be no content? No, no content would be uh, when you do a get on a content which is not there. This will delete will result you are okay. 200. Okay. Yeah, because it has successfully performed the operation. Yeah. Then, then when should I use this status code as accepted? Accepted. 
Is it a code accepted? I have not so heard. Like in the response builder, you can see when you are building the subject, so there is there might be the word called exception. Where did you see that? Yeah, yeah, that, that is there. But I, I don't remember which, what exactly the code number is. But so I, because this is always the confusion that I have. Where do you use? There is no accepted code as such. There is only okay, and there are redirection codes. They are not content not found. Service unavailable. Ones, twos, threes, fours, fives, series of that. No, I don't remember the code name, but there is one accepted. Because recently I am working on this uh, Jersey only this mm -hmm. service implementation. So I'm not Maybe we can discuss that. Afterwards, we can have Yeah, after we can. Okay. I'm almost done. Like, uh, just wanted to add one more uh, uh, best practice of versioning, which we used. Like, you can actually uh, version your APIs. Like, how Twitter does it, it actually has a version number in appended to the URL. And suppose you want to, uh, say, uh, age out your API, you want to people to uh, use your new version of APIs. So you can, uh, an example could be move permanently, you can return a 301 which says that this this API has been used and you can actually say this is the new URL, use this API. Or you want to support the old API but actually do not want the people to use that API. So you can actually drag them using a 302 to the URI which is actually using. Suppose 2.1 you entered and you want to use 2.2. So you would redirect them to 2.2. So that is again the URL, you can do that. And what is the practice like? For example, I have an application where I have these API, right? So not all the API has changed actually. It is only few of them change. But usually people then upgrade pretty much, you know, all the stack of API in terms of the version. It is not like, so is it the practice, like I have an application, it has 100 API. So but that is specific to URL. You need not change everything. That is specific to you are pending inside a URL. That's the beauty of it. So the, if particular API has changed, uh, that URL has that. It but might happen that some API, API, the 1.1 API, say Facebook or Google Map or whatever. So their standard practices, as they come up with a new version, though the actual behavior or implementation need not to change, they pretty much change it. So I mean, though theoretically you are right, I mean, but what is the practice? I mean, we did not uh, implement like if like if we wanted to upgrade it, we upgrade everything. But if it was like a major change of something you are changing, suppose you're saying 70, that's what I'm assigned to assume, that saying 70 to 80 percent, everything you want to change, you're revamping everything, it's a big mi milestone, say Java 7 to Java 8. And some of the APIs are still not changed, but you want people to know that you are using the new version. So that could be a case where you can actually go ahead and append that this is a new version, actually, but you are using the old version. If you actually want to showcase it, you want to leverage that now every we have moved to new version. That could be a use case I can think of. So there are other cases also, let's say you, you have a new data center and that data center is listening to a new version uh, which is much faster, like let's say that data center has more servers, older data center has older version, older servers. So that is another use case. So it's yeah. up to you like what you want to do. Basically, yeah, because it's a little bit, I think in this case it is clear, but typically what happened when you are just building your application, uh, like for example in your case, mm -hmm. now you uh, go on with the first version, there is no confusion actually. And then somebody uses your version 1. Now you have come up with the product version and few API has changed. So now you just change the, you know, only the version of the few API, then everybody has to, whoever already calling your API you know, has to change kind of that word. That's what uh, end of support and all those things happen. There's like uh, JBoss 3, I think that's called, that is end of support, you, you say. Like if you say end of support has reached, it has ended the support of one, so you just uh, you give that 301 that this is not at all supported. And you give a backward compatibility. So that's then, support thing. How do you reduce the cycle? For example, for other person, I can just say that uh, because I have upgraded all the versions, all you have to do from somewhere where you have configured the URL base, you just change the URL base to now it was v1 to v2. And pretty much everything is like uh, it is same for you. Yeah. Right? Because I have just changed implementation yes. inside, but to him it is still same. Yeah. Otherwise, he has to, if I just do for two or three or, you know, 50 of out of.